hello, Miss Sheila. Hello, Brother Keith. And I appreciate you guys being on tonight. Uh, Miss Susan, I, I am glad that you're off work tonight, too, and you're able to join us. And uh, had, I don't think I've had you on uh, the broadcast yet, but we sure do appreciate you taking time to be a part of, of what's going on. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 96, I'll sing a song, to verses 1 through 4. Psalm chapter number 96, I want you to sing along with us. And, uh, uh, and even if you can't uh, carry a tune in a bucket or, or you get static when you play the radio, the Father says make a joyful noise. And so fortunately, uh, others won't have to hear you. Amen. <laughs> and uh, so if you can't carry a tune, just sing anyway. Um, Psalm 96, we're going to be singing Psalm 96 tonight in verses 1 through 4. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord. Bless his holy name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Hello, Paul Lee. Good to have you tonight. Appreciate you being on with us tonight. And so let's get our Bibles and let's get our singing voices ready to go. All right. Hello, Brother Jeremy. Good to have you join with us tonight too. Psalm 96, sing along with us. Sing unto the Lord a new song. verses 1 through 4 and uh, no reason that we cannot sing the psalms that the Lord has given us you know that's what the early church sang and that's what the believers sang years ago they didn't have a red or green or blue hymn book and and uh, they didn't have they had the psalms and uh, they had uh, uh, the writings that were given to them and they wrote songs uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs is what the apostle Paul talks us uh, tells us that we're to sing uh, and we're to sing those songs that reflect and refer back to our Father, back to our Savior, uh, those things that are spiritual, uh, not songs about me or you or how do do, but it's songs about our Savior. It's all about Him. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about Him. And so if you've got your Bibles tonight, we're going to get right into the Bible study and uh, going to continue on in the book of Romans, chapter number 3. And uh, been excited about this. Been reading through it, studying through it, and uh, making notes. And uh, and of course, when we get through the study, we get all the way through chapter 16. We're going to read it in its entirety. Okay, and so probably the last broadcast on on Romans will will be, will be spent just reading the letter uh, in its entirety. And so. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Got, got quite a ways to go yet, so we're still getting into it. Hello, Brother Michael Patterson. Good to have you. Appreciate you uh, being with us tonight. Uh, missing you folks. Uh, sorry we didn't get to see you the last time we was down in Georgia. Going to get there again if, not, if the weather don't hold us up the next time. All right, so Romans chapter 3, and I, I want to read this, okay? And I know some of you... Some of you are probably going to, you know, you might get angry or been out of shape, uh, but, um, you know, you, 
you can forgive me later. Sometimes it's easier to uh, get permission, I mean, for, to get forgiveness than it is to get permission. But I'm going to read this out of the Peshitta. Now, the Peshitta is the earliest um, uh, translation of the New Testament. It comes from the Aramaic, okay? The Aramaic was the language of the disciples. It was the language of Messiah. Uh, it was the language of the apostles. It was the language of, of the writers of the New Testament. And it was translated from Aramaic into Greek. And we've got this idea that it was written in, in, in Greek, but it was originally spoken and written in Aramaic, okay? It was a violation of, of Hebrew and Jewish culture to even learn uh, a, a language of the heathens. They said, uh, and I'll, I'll read this quote to you, uh, said that uh, uh, it would have been, uh, let's, let me see if I can find, find this. I found this to be very interesting. He said, Josephus, the, uh, the historian, uh, 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 wrote in his Jewish wars in Aramaic and later translated into Greek for the Greek-speaking Roman citizens. Even in his latter antiquities quoted above shows that Josephus was not fluent enough in Greek. The Jewish rabbis of that time forbade the teaching of pagan tongues to their young men. They taught that it was preferable to feed one son the flesh of swine than to teach him Greek. And so uh, the... Uh, the original languages of our Bible and of our of of our of our uh, biblical forefathers came from Aramaic, and I want to read to you tonight Romans chapter three in the English translation of the Aramaic, and and follow along with me in your Bible. You'll find it very interesting uh, at how the words are put together and how the the phrases uh, uh, are put together. It, it flows very very well. Uh, but follow along with me in your in your Bible, and and then we'll get right back to our our normal English Bible uh, when it comes to the teaching. Hello, brother David Jackson. Appreciate you joining us tonight. Uh, chapter three, verse one. What therefore is the excellence of the Jews, or what is the advantage of circumcision? Much in everything, first that they were entrusted with the words of God. For if some of them did not believe, did they nullify the faith of God by not believing? God forbid. For God is true and every person lies, just as that which is written, you will be upright in your words and you will be victorious when they judge you. But if our evil establishes the justice of God, what shall we say? Is God doing evil by bringing forth his wrath? I am speaking as a man. God forbid, otherwise, how will God judge the universe? For if the truth of God is made to superabound for his glory by my lies, why therefore am I judged as a sinner? Or is it as those whose judgment is reserved for justice slander us and report that we say, let us practice evil that good may come? What then? Are we held to be greater because we have precedence? We have determined about the Jews and about the Aramaeans that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is not a just person, not even one. Neither is there one who understands nor one who seeks God. They have all turned away together and they have been rejected and there is not one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open tombs, their tongues are deceitful and the venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness, and their feet are swift to shed blood. Adversity and wretchedness are in their way. The way of peace they have not known. And the awesomeness of God is not before their eyes. But we know that whatever things the written law has said, it has said to those who are into the written law, that every mouth may be shut and the whole universe may be guilty before God. Because by works of the written law, no one is justified before him. For by the written law, sin has been made known. But now the justice of God has been revealed without the written law, and the written law and the prophets testify of it. But the righteousness of God is by the faith of Yeshua the Messiah unto every person, also upon every person who believes in him, for there is no distinction. Because all of them have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God and are made right by grace without charge and by the redemption that exists in Yeshua the Messiah. This one whom God preordained as the atonement by the faith of his blood for the sake of our sins which we had formerly sinned 
in the space that God in his patience has given to us for the demonstration of his justice, which is in this time, that he would be the just one and would by justice declare righteous the one who is in the faith of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. Where is pride therefore? It has been eliminated with him. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. We determine therefore that by faith a man is made righteous and not by the works of the written law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Because God is one who declares the circumcision righteous by faith and also the uncircumcision by faith. Therefore, are we eliminating the written law by faith? God forbid, but we are establishing the written law. And so when you read that in the Aramaic, it really brings to light and makes a whole lot of sense as to what the, the scriptures are saying uh, in our English Bible. Now I want us to go back to this and I want us to try to dissect this a little bit and understand exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about. What he is not saying, okay, what he is not saying is that the written law is of no validation or of no use for us anymore. That is not what he's saying. He, he says that at the end of the chapter. Now, you've got to remember that it was not until the Geneva Bible that we had chapters and verses and punctuation and all that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, that was about 1560. So uh, for 1,500 years, uh, there was no punctuation, okay? This, like I said, this is a letter. And, and our English translators and those who put together our English Bible, they cut this thing up and they've broken it up, but we read a letter from beginning to end and, and we put it all into context as to what the letter is talking about. And Paul is not saying in the book of Romans that the law is done away with. He's not saying that at all. As a matter of fact, he said there in verse number 31, he said totally the contrary or totally opposite. He said, do that we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not, yea, we establish, or that word establish means to make stand, to make firm, or to uphold the law, the written law. And so when you look back at, at the beginning of chapter number three, where our English uh, translators and, uh, and, and English, uh, uh, those that put together our, our English Bible have cut this up, he continues on the thought from chapter number two. Notice what chapter number two says in verse number uh, let's just uh, start uh, verse number 26. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision doth transgress the law? For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of Elohim. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way. Look at that. I want you to see that. I want you to see it. This is not a negative connotation. This is a positive connotation. What profit is there to be a Jew? Or what profit is there to be of circumcision? He says, much. Uh, the Aramaic refers to it, says much in everything. That's a positive connotation, okay? He says, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God or the oracles of Elohim. Uh, for unto them were committed or entrusted the words of God. You got to remember that the Bible teaches that, the, that salvation is of the Jews. Remember when when Yeshua went to the woman at the well and, and he told her, he said, salvation is of the Jews, that I'm bringing the, the word of life to the Jew, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, okay? So the advantage is that the Jew had the truth. They had the oracles of God. They had the writings. They had the teachings. And they twisted it up and they messed it up and they and they they bamfoozled it and, and uh, it's just, it's just, Hey, Miss Crystal, I'm glad glad you made it anyway. Amen. It's it's all right that you're late. Better better late than never. Amen. But the Jews had the written law of God. They had the written word. It was given to them. Remember, Yahweh did not make a covenant with the Gentiles. He made a covenant with Hebrew. 
He didn't make a covenant with the Europeans. He made a covenant with Israel. He didn't make a covenant with the Muslims. He made a covenant with Israel. He didn't make a covenant with the Chinese. He made a covenant with Israel. He didn't make a covenant with Russia. He, he made a covenant with Israel. He didn't make a covenant with Egypt. He didn't make a covenant with Canaan. He didn't make a covenant with the, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and the, and the, the Canaanites. He made a covenant with Israel. Hello, Miss Peggy. That's okay for being late. No, no, no problem. We're in Romans chapter number three. And so the advantage was that the Jew, the Hebrew, had the word of God. It's much like someone, someone that's been in church and someone that's never been in church, okay? There is somewhat of, somewhat of an advantage because they already know a lot of the Word of God, or that they're supposed to already know a lot of the Word of God. But the problem is today, many non-believers coming into faith are grasping it and learning it more and quicker than the ones that are supposed to know it. But there was an advantage. There was an advantage much in every way, chiefly because and unto them were committed the oracles and the words of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? He says, for if some of them did not believe, did they nullify the faith of God without believing? He said, God forbid. For God is true and every person lies. Every man's a liar. Certainly not. Let God be true, but let every man be a liar as is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome them, overcome when thou art judged. The Peshitta writes this, says, God forbid, for God is true, and every person lies, just as that which is written, you will be upright in your words, and you will be victorious when they judge you. You know, if you always tell the truth and you don't lie and try to cover things up, they can't catch you in a lie. Have, has, has anybody ever, out there ever told a lie? Be honest, raise your hand. Told a lie, and then you had to tell another lie to cover up the first lie? And then he had to tell another lie to cover up the second lie, which covered up the first lie, and then another lie to cover up that one and cover up that one. And, and then before long, you're telling so many lies, you can't remember what the first lie was, and you get yourself all messed up. I got one thumbs up. One person out there, there's a couple of you that's, that's being honest. He says there that, that it is written that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, or if he says that we will be upright in, our, in, in your words, you'll be victorious when they judge you. But if our evil establishes the justice of God, what shall we say? Is, doing, is God doing evil by bringing forth his wrath? It says, God forbid, verse number six. Otherwise, how will God judge the universe? He says, for if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also being judged as a sinner? And not rather, verse number eight, or is it as those whose judgment is reserved for justice, they slander us and they report that we say, let us practice evil that good may come. Did you catch that? Paul said they slander us. They slander us and they, they report slanderously. Slanderous is a lie. They report falsely that we are saying, let's do evil so that good may come. Paul's not saying that. He's not saying that at all. He says, well, then are we better than they? No, we're not better than they are. We, we, we have an advantage. The Jew had an advantage, but he said, we're not better than they are. He said, no, we're not better. He said, for both have proved the, that both Jews and Gentiles, Jews and Aramaeans are all under sin. Now, where does the Bible say that? Well, if you look in Psalm chapter 14, go, uh, go back to the Old Testament, go to Psalm chapter number 14, you'll find where David wrote in the Psalms chapter number 14, uh, wrote this very thing. And he says in Psalm chapter number 14 and verse 1, 2, and 3, which is a quote of verse number 9, he says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none to do with good. Yahweh looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did, uh, uh, that did understand and seek Elohim. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Paul's not saying anything that hadn't already been said. 
He's repeating, basically quoting again, that we find many, many hundreds of times in the New Testament, quoting Old Testament verses and, and quoting the verses of the, of the law and the Psalms and the prophets. It's also there in verse number one, chapter number one and verse 10 of 1 John. If you look there in the, all the way back towards the back of the Bible, towards the book of Revelation, you'll find 1 John chapter number one and verse number 10. And you'll see John writes and he says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So all have sinned. What is it, what is, what is it the Romans 2.23 said the, the, uh, last week? Uh, or, or I'm sorry, Romans 3. Romans 3.23 is going to say it. We're kind of getting ahead of it. But for all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. He says there in verse number 9, he says uh, that both Jews and Gentiles are under sin. They're no better. They had an advantage, but they're no better. The Jews are not righteous before God because they, they were given the law. They violated the law. They broke it. They rejected God's law. They rejected God's Torah. They rejected God's Son. They, they rejected the Messiah as a whole, as a nation. And so therefore, it, uh, uh, Yahweh turned it to the Gentiles and allowed them access into, into uh, salvation. Now notice what it says in verse 10. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. We, we read that. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after Elohim. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now look over to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Ecclesiastes. I had a young man in our church, our first church we started back in 1992. He couldn't say Ecclesiastes. He called it Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastics. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7 and verse number 20. Notice what the Bible says. For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. On your best day, my friend, you are still a sinner. A rotten, no good, wicked, low down sinner. On your best day. I, I, I remember hearing a prayer one time, a fellow prayed. said, Lord, I've not sinned today. I've not had a bad thought. I've not had a bad word. I've not said anything evil. I've not done anything wrong. But now I'm getting out of bed and my feet are getting ready to hit the floor and I know I'm going to mess up. Even in sleep. I'm sure we have evil thoughts and evil dreams and things like that. Paul goes on to say there in verse number 13, he said, their throat is an open sepulcher. Uh, the Peshitta uh, records it as their throats are open tombs. Their tongues are deceitful and the venom of asps or poisonous snakes are under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness and their feet are swift to shed blood. Adversity and wretchedness are in their way. The way of peace they have not known and the awesomeness or the fear of God is not before their eyes. Paul is just basically laying it out right there that, that all of us are wretched and all of us need a savior. All of us need redemption. All of us need grace. All of us have been afforded and given the opportunity to, to know who Yahweh is and know who his son Yeshua is we have all been given the opportunity. Hey, all of us need grace and all of us need salvation. All of us need to be forgiven because all of us are sinners, every one of us, from the top down. Even, like I said, even on your best day, you're still a wretched, wicked sinner. And that's what Paul's saying here in chapter number three, verses, verses nine through, through 17, 18. He goes on to say there in verse number 19, he says, he says, but we know that whatever things the written law has said, I'm reading from the Peshitta again, it has said to those who are into the law and that every mouth may be shut, the whole universe may be guilty before, uh, before God. Who's guilty before God? The whole universe. Stand guilty. If we were judged today, we'd be, we, we would all be judged guilty. Guilty. Because we are sinners. We are sinners by nature and we are sinners by actions. Uh, you that have children, you did not have to teach your children how to lie. You didn't have to teach your children how to steal. You didn't have to teach your children how to fight. You didn't have to teach your children how to bear false witness. You didn't have to teach your children how to curse. You didn't have to teach them how to do those things. You didn't have to teach them how to disobey. You didn't have to teach your children how to, how to be mean. 
and cantankerous and disrespectful and, re and, and rebellious. Oh no, it's in their nature, just like it's in our nature. That's, that's who we are. It's in our nature. And he says, now we know that what things are the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, verse number 20, therefore by the deeds or the works of the written law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Isn't that interesting? By the law is the knowledge of sin. Well, let's look over to 1 John chapter 3. Go back to the back of the Bible, 1 John chapter 3. Glad that you all are still, still staying with us. 1 John chapter 3. Good to see Brother Billy with us tonight. Hello, Brother, Brother Pastor Billy Krager, all the way from, from uh, Kansas. We're going to be out there to see you in, uh, in a couple weeks. 1 John chapter 3, and let's look at verse number 4. Paul said here in Romans chapter 3, verse number 20, he said, For by the law, the written law, is the knowledge of sin. And what is the written law? That's the Torah of God, the Torah. Okay. 1 John chapter 3, verse number 4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. What is a transgression? A transgression is a breaking of the law, a violation of the law. You have a you speed down the highway and you break the speed limit, that's a transgression of the law. You you shoplift, that's a transgression of the law. You commit theft, that's a transgression of the law. You you cheat on your taxes and you don't pay your taxes, that's a transgression of the law. You run a stop sign, that's a transgression of the law. You commit murder, larceny, you know, you you beat your spouse, you beat your children, that's a transgression of, of the law, the law of our land. Sin is a transgression of God's law. God said no, and we said, who cares? Look over to Genesis chapter number three in verse eleven. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter three and verse number eleven. Genesis chapter three, verse number eleven. And notice what it says. It says, and he said, who told thee that thou wast naked? I, I don't think that Yahweh was very pleased. Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? But don't you think he already knew that? Yes, he did. He wanted them to know that he knew. I was telling, telling someone today about uh, some of my children. They, they got caught in sin and got caught in, in little acts of rebellion and, and acts of sin and and and. And, and I told them that I knew that they did what they did because I wanted them to know that I knew that they, I wanted to, I'm getting, getting confused. I wanted them to know that I knew what they did. What they did. <laughs> <laughs> there's too many, there's too many adjectives and, and, and adverbs and all that kind of stuff in there. So he says, he says, did you eat of the tree that I commanded you not to? So Paul says, back in Romans chapter 3, verse number 20, he says, he says uh, no flesh is justified in his sight by the deeds of the law. Nothing we can do by following the deeds of the law to justify ourselves because it's the law that reveals to us what sin really is because even on our best day, we cannot keep the law. If you say you're a keeper of the law, no, 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 you're a, a follower of the law. You're a follower of the Torah, the follower of the commandments, but hard for us to be full keepers because we sin. Paul goes on to say there in verse number 21, but now the righteousness of Elohim without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. You know, where there is no law, there's no sin. Where there's no law, there's no sin. Uh, that's, that's in Romans chapter 4, verse number 15. Kind of jump ahead. Remember, this whole thing's in context. Romans chapter 4, verse 15 said, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. For those that want to say, Well, the law is abolished and Jesus nailed it to the cross and all, well, then sin's gone. There's no more sin. We're no longer sinners. But that's not that's not that's not true. That's not what the Bible's teaching. It's not what Paul's trying to convey here. He's trying to get us to understand that the law has a purpose. The, the Torah, the law, the commandments of God have a purpose. 
They reveal to us our sin nature. They reveal to us how wretched and wicked we are. And they reveal to us what our need is. And our need is forgiveness and salvation and mercy. And just because we have grace and mercy, that does not, that does not eliminate the fact that we still need the law to guide us and direct us. The Peshitta, the Peshitta reads in verse number 22, or verse number 20 and 21, he says, because the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one is justified before him, for by the written law, sin has been made known. But now the justice of God has been revealed without the written law, and the written law and the prophets testify of that justice. He also says, but the righteousness of God is by the faith of Yeshua the Messiah unto every person also upon every person who believes in him, for there is no distinction. The righteousness of God is by faith in Yeshua Messiah. By faith, by faith. Hey, Abraham had faith. Abraham had faith. Noah had faith. Enoch had faith. Isaac had faith. Jacob had faith. But Abraham, God told Isaac there in Genesis that Abraham... His faith was counted to him for righteousness, but he still kept his commandments, laws, and statutes, and judgments. His faith led him to be obedient because the first step, of, uh, first step of faith is obedience. Obedience to repent. Obedience to confess. Obedience to believe. Uh, to believe. Faith, faith to believe. Now, Paul goes on to say there in verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. That's what the Aramaic reads, deprived of the glory of God. And then it goes on to say, and are made right by grace without charge and by the redemption that exists in Yeshua the Messiah, being justified freely by his grace, freely, without charge, without charge. said, whom, whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. The Aramaic reads, this one whom God preordained as the atonement or the at one by the faith of his blood for the sake of our sins, which, he had formerly, which we had formerly sinned, in the space that God in his patience has given to us for the demonstration of his justice, which, in, which is in this time that he would be the just one and would by justice declare righteous the one who is in the faith of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah. It was by the justice of Almighty God that Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Savior, was crucified and bled and died. Justice had to be served. Justice had to be served. We couldn't pay our own sin debt. We could not, 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 not by the blood of bulls and lambs and, and goats and turtle doves, but by one man, by his blood, the righteous one, the just one, Yeshua Messiah, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the only way to salvation. He is the only way of eternal life. And it was by his blood, Paul says there in Romans chapter number three, verse 25, whom God or Elohim has sent forth to be an atonement or a propitiation through faith in his blood, not the blood of goats and bulls, but in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of Elohim. Verse 26, of course, talks about the justice that the just one would would by justice declare righteous the one who is in the faith of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah? Let me tell you something. Righteousness does not come by works, but true righteousness is revealed by obedience and by works. Paul goes on to say that. He'll, he'll say that here just shortly as we conclude, as we continue in this study. Notice what he says in verse number 27. He said, where is boasting then? Where is pride? He said, Is it, it, it has been eliminated by him. Remember, the Jews were proud. The Jews were proud because they had the advantage. We have the advantage. We have the, tip, we have the temple. Had the temple. We had the tabernacle. We had the Ark of the Covenant. We had the law of God. We had the Torah. 
we have all the good all the the good things from God. Paul says, where is pride, therefore? Where is boasting? It has been eliminated by him. By what law? The law of works? No, by the law of faith. Law of faith. The law of faith brings us into righteousness in the Yeshua Messiah, the law of faith. Faith brings out obedience, and obedience brings out pleasing to our Heavenly Father. Notice what else it says. We determine, therefore, that by faith a man is made righteous and not by the works of the written law. By faith, we conclude that a man is justified or made righteous by faith without the deeds of the law, apart from the works of the law. Paul says, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles only. He goes on to say, Paul said they're, they're in the book of Ephesians, chapter number two, that they're no longer called Gentiles once they come in the faith of Yeshua. They're no longer Gentiles. Gentiles were heathens. They're no longer called, called Gentiles, but they're, they're, they're fellow citizens with the saints and household of God. They're called Israel, brought into the covenant, the covenant that Yeshua made, that Yahweh made with, with Israel. He goes on to say, seeing it is one God or one Elohim which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision by faith. In our, in our English Bible, it, it, it confusing to, to some people. If you'll notice there in verse number 30, you've got the word by faith and through faith. When you look both of those words up, they're two different words, but they mean basically the same thing. They mean by faith. That not only is the circumcision justified by faith, the circumcision being the Jews, but also the uncircumcision or the Gentiles or the heathens. That one God, one Elohim, one Savior shall justify the circumcision and the uncircumcision by the same manner, and that is by faith. By faith in Yeshua Messiah. And then Paul, Paul just lays it out right here in verse number 31. He said, do we then make void the law through faith? People say, well, the law is done away with it because it's all about faith. No, he said, no, we don't, we don't make void the law. He said, we're not eliminating the written laws, and God forbid, but we are establishing the written law. Like I said before, establishing meaning to uphold or to make stand. We're making stand the written law. Now, Paul continues on in chapter 4, and he says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh had found? Remember I talked talk about Abraham before? He said, for if Abraham were justified by works, he hath were of the glory. I did the, remember the publican and the Pharisee praying at the wall? The Pharisee says, I thank God that I'm not like this publican. I, I pray three times a day and three, three times in the week. I fast twice in the week and, and I go to the temple and I wear the right clothes and I carry the right Bible and I have the right kind of attitude and I'm glad I'm not like this publican. And the publican could not even lift up his head but he smote his breast and said, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Pharisee had boasting and the publican had nothing but, but please, mercy. That's what Paul said. If Abraham were justified by works, then, then he would have a place to boast. He'd have a place to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God or believed Elohim and it was counted unto him for righteousness. The Peshitta says, there said, for what do the scriptures say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Same thing. Abraham was declared righteous because he believed God. What does it mean to believe? To believe something exists? Oh, no, no, no. To believe is to act upon that belief. To believe God is to live in accordance with that belief. He believed God. It was faith. He walked in faith. And in walking in faith, we walk out the ways of our Savior. He believed God. He said, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. The Peshitta says in verse number four, but the wages of one who labors are not accounted to him as a favor, but as that which is owed to him. God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing. We've not done anything to earn righteousness. 
We've not done anything to earn the grace of God. We've not done, done anything to earn mercy and salvation. We've not done that. It's all by grace. We've not done anything to earn it. What does Paul say there in Titus chapter 3, verse, verse number 5? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. <coughs> says, but the wages of one who labors are not accounted to him as a favor, but as that which is owed to him. Today was payday on my job. Did they pay me because they thought I was just a, just a sweet person and did they just, man, you know. no, they paid me because I earned it. I worked for the last two weeks. And so therefore, it was part of, my, part of my, my, my salary. I worked. If I didn't work, I didn't get no money. It's just that simple. So it wasn't no, it was no grace there. It was no 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 mercy. If it was grace and mercy, I'm asking for more because it ain't enough. Amen. It goes on to say there, verse number five. But to the one who does not labor, look at verse number five. But the one who does not labor, but believes only in the one who justifies sinners, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Now remember, we're reading on through this, and 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 the Bible would. And, and people would say, oh, well, Paul's doing away with the law. No, go back to verse number 31. Remember, we're, we're, we can't lead the context. You can't lead the context. Go back to verse number 31. It's still there. We do not make void or abolish the law or eliminate the law. We uphold it. We make it stand, okay? Not for salvation. Not for salvation. I keep saying this over and over again. Everybody, everybody keeps accusing me of being a cult. Everybody accuses me of... Of, of, of stepping away from the faith and not not uh, uh, not uh, not believing the Bible anymore. Oh no, no, I believe it even more than you can ever imagine. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by the law. But the law is good for us in order to live by, to walk in accordance to. The law was not abolished and it was not done away away with. Paul says we don't we don't dismiss it, we don't abolish it, but we uphold it. We we, as the King James Bible says, we establish it, which means to uphold, to make stand, or to make firm. To make it firm. Now, it says in verse number six there, it says, just as David also said about the blessedness of a man to whom God accounts righteousness without works, as he said, blessed are those whose evils are forgiven them and whose sins are covered. Where did David say that at? David said that in Psalm chapter 32, verse number one. Paul, again, referring back to David, referring back to, the, hey, remember, there was grace even back then. There was grace in the Old Testament. Grace is not a new concept. Grace is not a New Testament con concept. Noah had grace. The Bible says in, 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 uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 6 that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hey, Adam and Eve found grace because if it had not been, been for grace, they'd have been uh, totally annihilated from the, from the planet right out of the garden because of their sin. So grace was from the very, very beginning. It's not a new concept. Paul referring there to David there in Psalm chapter 32, verse number one. And then, and then in verse number two, he, he doubles down and said, blessed is the man to whom Yahweh will not impute sin. He said, in this blessing, therefore, on the circumcision or on the uncircumcision, Verse number nine said, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? The Jews only? Anytime you see the word circumcision it referred to the Jews, and you see the word uncircumcision referring to the Gentiles. Okay? So he says, the, does this blessedness come only on the Jews or on the Gentiles? Does it come only on the circumcision or on the uncircumcision? For we say his faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. Genesis chapter 15, verse number six. Another reference to the Old Testament. Paul referring in his letter to the Roman, to the believers there at Rome. And, and why would he do that? Now, now think about this. Why don't you put your thinking cap on? If he's talking to Gentiles in this letter, they have no clue who Abraham is. They have no clue what Genesis chapter 15 and verse Number six is. They have no clue who David is. They might have heard him in passing, but they'd have, hey, the Jews had the advantage. Guess what? They had the, the Torah scrolls. They had the scrolls of the Psalms. They read the Psalms and they read the prophets and they read the Torah in the synagogues and in the temple. What do you think Yeshua Jesus Christ was reading out of when he, when he stood up and read out of the book of Isaiah? 
He was reading out of the Torah scroll. He was reading, uh, reading the prophet, reading the Haftarah. That's why Paul's writing to, 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 to believers, Jews. Jews, saved Jews at Rome. And Gentiles who have come into the faith. He's referring back to Genesis. He's referring back to the Psalms. He's referring back to the Old Testament. He's referring back to the prophets. And he says in verse number 10, How therefore was it accounted to him in circumcision or in uncircumcision? It was not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. How, how did Abraham attain righteousness if it was all about circumcision? Because Abraham was declared righteous before he was ever circumcised. How many of you knew that? Abraham was declared righteous before he was ever circumcised. He believed God before he ever submitted to circumcision. Circumcision was an act of obedience. It had nothing to do with his righteousness. It had nothing to do with his faith. It was a symbol and a testimony of his separation. Much like we have today. It's kind of like the law. Hey, hey guys. Hey, we follow the Torah. We follow the law. Why? It's a sign of our separation. We worship on the Sabbath. Why? That's a sign between God and his people. The Sabbath is a sign between God and his people. And we worship on the Sabbath because that's what Yahweh told us to do. And Abraham said, well, God said I need to get circumcised, so therefore I'm going to do it. And so he did it. Did it make him more, more righteous? No. He did it out of obedience. He was already declared righteous because of his faith. That's where we got to understand. Paul was trying to get us to understand and trying to get the people at Rome to understand. It wasn't about the circumcision. Remember the Gentiles? Remember the argument there in Acts chapter number 15? Go to Acts 15. I want you to see this. You guys still with me? Let's, uh, some of you still talking. You guys still with me? Show me some hearts, some thumbs. Let me know you're still out there and you ain't fell asleep. Amen? Acts chapter number 15. Acts chapter number 15. This was a big argument. Oh, Miss Sharon gave a thumbs up. Amen. You could go on Facebook and you could do that. <laughs> you could do that. So Acts chapter number 15. Now watch this. Acts 15. This is the big argument everybody wants to talk about. Oh, well, you know. And they take, they take the whole chapter out of context. Okay? Council of Jerusalem. Chapter 15, verse number 1. And certain men which came from down from Judea taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. That was the argument. That was the fight. Now, what's Paul talking about? He's talking about the same thing. He's kind of referring to the same thing. He's, he's using the same analogy because evidently it was the same argument. It was the same, it was the same contention. He says back there in Romans chapter number four, he said, when did Abraham receive righteousness? He said there in verse number 10, how was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision? How did, how did his righteousness get reckoned to Abraham? Verse number nine, that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it done? Was it done before circumcision? Or was it done after circumcision? It was done before circumcision. Because there, the, the argument there in Acts chapter number 15 was, except you be circumcised, you cannot be saved. That's the same crowd that's going around here. Except you dress like this and do this and do this. And if you're not a Baptist, you're going to hell. It's the same, it's the same argument. It's just, a different, it's just a different rule. It's just a different man-made thing. But let me just go on record. I do believe that, that you, should, you should still be circumcised. I do. I do. God, number one, God said it. I may not have to understand it, but God said it, number one. Okay? It's not for salvation, but it is for holiness and for separation. And it's for health. It's for your health also. Okay? So under, understand this. It's very, it's, 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 even though uh, circumcision was not for salvation, I, I still believe, I still believe that it's, it's, it's relevant. Amen? Thank you for those. So we look back in Romans chapter number four and we see that, that Paul says, uh, how did he come about his righteousness? Was it in circumcision or in uncircumcision? He said it was in uncircumcision. He says, but he, re and, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. 
The Peshitta reads it like this, for he received circumcision as a sign and the seal of the righteousness of his faith. When in uncircumcision, that he would be the father to all those who believe among the uncircumcision, that it would be reckoned to them also for righteousness. It's kind of the same with baptism. Except you be baptized, you cannot be saved. That, that, that's, that's, not, that's not true. Baptism is a seal or a sign for our faith in Yeshua Messiah, just as circumcision was a seal and a sign for Abraham's position with Yahweh. It's still all by faith. But true faith will lead one to obedience. It'll lead one to live in righteousness. It'll lead one to live in obedience. Paul goes on to say there in verse number 12, and he is the father to the circumcision, but not only to those who are from the circumcision, but also to those who follow the steps of faith of the uncircumcision of our father Abraham. In Galatians chapter number, let's see, Galatians chapter number three, I believe it is. Look there in Galatians chapter three. <clears throat> Verse just came to my mind. What, what, what's the time, Miss Sharon? 9.22. All right. Okay. So we, we, we're going we're gonna to get, get close to wrapping this thing up. So Galatians chapter number three, and let's uh, look at uh, verse number 11. Well, let's see. No, let's just go back. Let's just start at verse number, uh, verse number one of, of Galatians 3. All foolish Galatians who have bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Yeshua Messiah hath been evidently set forth impaled or crucified among you. This only would I learn of you received you the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. That's kind of it's kind of a similar situation going on here. I mean, it, it's almost like he he xeroxed his letter and copied his letter and sent it off to the one he did for Romans and sent it off to the Galatians, except to just edit it out a little bit. It's kind of the same thing. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain? If it be yet in vain, he therefore that ministered to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Same argument, same problem. Even as Abraham believed Yahweh and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Same thing. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Is that not what Paul just said back in Romans chapter number four? He said in the, verse number 12, and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but also that walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Same thing, Paul. See, we, we have so twisted Paul's words and writings and we've, we've, we've taken our European thought and our, our intellectualism and we've totally twisted the words. And Peter said that that would happen in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. He said it was going to happen, that people were going to take the words of Paul and going to twist them because Paul's words were hard to understand and they twist his words leading themselves to destruction. Damnable heresies. Paul said the same thing in Galatians that he said in the book of Romans. He said there, said there in, in Galatians, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And then he goes on down there in verse number, verse number, um, <clears throat> verse number 14, said that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Yeshua Messiah, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And then he goes to verse number 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Messiah. The promises were made to Israel through Jacob, through Isaac and Jacob. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of Elohim and Messiah, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. He goes on to say there in verse number, verse number, uh, let's see, read on down verse number um, 26, for ye are all the children of Yahweh by faith in Messiah Yeshua. For as many of you as have been baptized in the Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Messiah Yeshua. And if ye be Messiahs, then are ye Abraham's seed 
and heirs according to the promise. Same basic thing he's saying in the book of Romans. Same basic thing. Look back in the book of Romans, he says in verse number 12, verse number 12, he said, he said there, uh, and he is the father to the circumcision and also the un uncircumcision that walk in the steps of his faith. For it was not by the written law that the promise came to Abraham and his seed that he would be the heir to the universe, but by the righteousness of his faith. For if these who are of the written law were the heirs, faith would have been worthless and the promise would have been void. For the written law is the worker of wrath. For where there is no written law, neither is there a violation of the written law. Going right back to what he said before. Back there in chapter number 3 and verse number 20. Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in sight for by the laws and knowledge of sin. Goes right back to it. He says there in verse number, verse number 15. He says, For the written law is the worker of wrath. For where there is no written law there is a violation of the written law. The King James writes, Because the law worketh wrath for where no law is, there is no transgression. No law, no sin. But the Bible says that sin is a transgression of, of the law. And so therefore the law is not violated, it's not abolished, it's not done away with according to verse number 31 of chapter 3. Paul just doubles down there in verse number 4, going back, referring back. Remember he's re writing a letter, referring back in another paragraph, back to his previous par paragraph. So therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. And that where he's talking about there in verse number 16, said not to that only of which is of the law. He's talking about the circumcision. He's talking about the Jews. Remember back in chapter number three, uh, what advantage had the Jew there? Uh, what advantage had the Jew? Uh, what advantage did it, did it profit the Jew? Much in every way because they had the law. He says there in verse number 16, he said the, that the, that is of faith, that it might be by grace to the end, not just to, the, to those of, that were of the law, but also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. I want to finish up the chapter, verse 17, according, and I'm going to read from the Peshitta. According to what is written, I have appointed you a father to the multitude of the nations before God in whom you believed, who gives life to the dead, and he calls those who are not as though they are. And without hope, he believed in hope that he would be the father to the multitude of the nations according to what is written, thus shall your seed be. Abraham never, never saw it. He never saw the fulfillment of the, of the promise. And he did not fail in his faith when he considered his body dead, for he was 100 years old in the dead womb of Sarah. And he did not doubt the promise of God as if his faith were lacking, but he was strengthened in faith and he gave praise to God, and he affirmed that whatever God promised him, he was able to perform. And hallelujah to that. If God says it, that settles it. God's able to do way above what we can ever imagine. Therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. There it is right there. What is it that, that, that made Abraham righteous? There in verse number 22, his faith, his faith. Therefore, it was imputed or accounted to him for righteousness. It was put on his account for righteousness because he believed God. Even though he never saw the promise, we were reading tonight. We were doing, we kind of got behind in our Torah study, and so we were finishing up the book of Exodus. And uh, hey, Sheila, uh, we were finishing up the book of Exodus, and uh, we found out that, that um, and I, I mean, I've read this a lot of times, and, and we always learn something every year that we do this. And, uh, that uh, David wanted to, uh, it, it was the reading in the, in the book of Kings that refers back to the temple that Solomon built. And Solomon, uh, given uh, uh, his dissertation about, about how God gave him the ability and the blessing to build the temple, and it said that David wanted to build the temple, and David had a desire to build the temple, but God blessed him for his desire because he knew that his heart was right in his desire, even though he never he didn't allow him to build the temple. And, and what I came away with that is that, you know what? God may not let us do the things that we want to do, but if we have a right heart attitude about those things, he'll bless us for it, for having the right heart attitude. Even though he may not let us do the things that we want to do, 
He'll bless us for having the right heart attitude. Man, I thought that was just awesome. It really, really was. Uh, verse, number, verse number 23 said, And this was not written for his sake alone, that his faith was accounted 